Dr. Bill Lewinsky, thank you, sir, for taking the time today to sit down and speak to us on the Interrupted Podcast. My pleasure, Steve. Thank you. Honored to be here. Hey, I, I appreciate that. From from the moment I, I, I met you and your team, uh, I've just really been blown away with your organization that I'm excited to, to bring to the audience today if they're going to be hearing about it for the first time. I know some listeners are familiar because we had uh, one of your, your staff on, uh, Mike Masingo, who uh, <laughs> just was an awesome show and was very well received. And we had mentioned you may be coming on during that show. And so I've received quite a few messages and things. So it, it's, it's a real honor. Honor for me, I'm humbled that you're taking the time, especially in this busy holiday week that we have to, to have a conversation. Well, thank you. Um, and Mike's a great guy. So, uh, absolutely, I, absolutely. Yeah. Well, there, there's a number of topics that I, I want to address today, but before we do that, would you set a little context for the listeners? Would you tell us a little bit uh, about your background and? and how you came to be doing what you're doing now. Um, and then, you know, we can get in, obviously, to everything that it, the, the force science um, community has really uh, given back to um, the behavioral science uh, field. Well, actually, it, it fits in very well with the interrupted, uh, the title of this podcast, The Interrupted Podcast, because I was uh, merrily going along, having a really great life uh, as a clinical psychologist and working as a psychologist with the Manitoba Department of Education, kind of a school-based, but a dealing with community problems and, and looking at how they surfaced in the school and how the school could work with them, but also how we coordinated community services. Mm-hmm. And so uh, in that uh, role, I'd spent a lot of time with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. This happened to be in the province of Manitoba. Uh, and prior to that, I'd spent a fair amount of time in martial arts. and I'd been looking at uh, terrorism and uh, oh, a variety of things of, of pathology. And um, when one of the Mounties went to Ottawa and studied uh, hostage negotiation, mm-hmm. uh, he came back and uh, showed me the training program. And uh, we, we shared thoughts on that. And then in January of 1976, um, he happened to respond to the most dramatic hostage situation, I think, yet uh, in Canadian history, in which one Mountie was killed, two were seriously injured. Um, the hostage uh, taker, it turned out to be a hostage taker, uh, hit four barricaded, uh, non-barricaded hostage sites, trading guns, ammunition, hostages, until he ended up at a doctor's residence. His partner was injured in the, uh, in the uh, preceding shootout uh, with the Mounties. And so he was determined to stay there until uh, she was able to travel, uh, which because of her liver wound would take two weeks. Mm. Uh, it happened to be January and it happened to be one of the worst winters in Manitoba history. Uh, the whole thing never got above 20 below. Um, oh and yeah, and the SWAT teams were out there at six hour intervals. Uh, but um, both the Mounties were seriously, that were injured, were seriously injured. Um, and one of them was on the operating table literally every day. But the Mountie that was uh, dealing with the negotiations um, called me, uh, wanting me to kind of debrief the officers after the incident. Um, and so I ended up at D Division headquarters in, in Winnipeg. Um, and as I began to hear what was going on in that situation, I realized this guy was a full-blown psychopathic paranoid. Uh, and sure enough, he was. Um, and they just fled from a uh, murder scene in Saskatchewan in which they had uh, murdered one of their sex club members uh, and were fleeing from that when they encountered the, uh, the Mounties. Uh, and so I began to share information and they eventually asked me to go out to the hostage scene uh, and to assist in the negotiations. I eventually ended up profiling uh, the guy and directing the negotiations based on that. But in the middle of that, I saw some of the most committed, most dedicated people I'd ever seen, some of whom had paid a terrible price for being in the profession and doing what they did. And I made a commitment at that point that if I could do anything to assist this profession, I would. And literally changed the whole course of my life. And we are here in force science because of 
that incident in Manitoba. And that was January of 1976. Wow. That hostage situation lasted uh, five days. And I'd set up a think tank at the University of Manitoba. Uh, and my clinical uh, supervisor at the time was Dr. Harry Prozen, chairperson of the Canadian Psychiatric Association. And Harry said, uh, I called Harry and I, I said, we've got this full blown psychopathic paranoid. Uh, and he's convinced of this and that. And we're directing negotiations this way. And Harry said, if we don't get him out in five days, he's going to kill himself, but kill everybody first. Um, and so uh, we set the negotiations to break him before he killed everybody mm. and himself. And we got him out the morning that Harry said <laughs> was the last day. Oh my goodness. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, that's why I'm down here because I, I wanted to work in the uh, area of police psychology and uh, that meant moving to the United States. Um, took a variety of degrees here. Um, and then started teaching at a uh, university in a law enforcement program, ended up uh, 28 years there, um, including being uh, director of the law enforcement program and also uh, chairperson of the Department of Government. Um, and in there, in the university, I set up the research center that is the forerunner of For Science Today. Okay. But if you want to look at a life's interruption, that was a life's interruption that literally restructured everything in my life. What What were some of the things, if if you don't mind talking, that maybe if it, things that come to mind about that restructuring? What were some of? I don't know if it was perception or what you believe to be true. How did it How did it reshape um, who you are and what your life's work has been? Well, my focus up until that time was uh, uh, family, profession. Um, as a clinical psychologist and a clinical school-based psychologist, uh, just doing testing and therapy. And um, I was extremely interested in human performance mm -hmm. and had done some work with the Canadian military uh, before then. Uh, but uh, it, it was a literally a total restructuring. I mean, I had to change uh, my academic goals. I had to change my professional goals. Um, mm. Literally in the transition became poorer than I'd ever been in my life <laughs> because it costs <laughs> to make dramatic changes. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, so yeah, it's, it was literally uh, restructuring on everything who I was and, and uh, uh, my professional goals and the rest of it. Uh, but at, at that point in, in the seventies, I was very interested in, uh, the clinical components of law enforcement, primarily looking at uh, uh, communication, hostage negotiation, problem resolution, and some of the areas that we now term uh, uh, perceptual distortions, which are not really perceptual distortions. That name needs to be changed. Um, but the, some, of the, uh, some of the price that officers pay for being in the profession. Uh, and uh, as I transitioned into that, um, I became aware of the need in the profession for really understanding the human performance elements. Mm -hmm. And some of that came out of my martial arts background and understanding of, of uh, focus issues and uh, um, emotional regulation, emotional intensity and, and focused intensity. Um, some of it uh, came out of um, just the thousands, literally thousands of officers that I have interviewed at this point, it's well over 3,000 officers I've interviewed yeah. who have made a deadly force decision. Um, and that's totally apart from SEAL team and force recon and a variety of other specialized, uh, special military units. But um, so as I began to do more uh, uh, interviews, it became clear that if we didn't understand, for instance, movement dynamics, uh, time distortion has no meaning. Uh, for instance, um, you may have, um, I, I know you have talked to officers that have been involved in shootings. One of the things Absolutely. is time speeds up for a small percentage of officer. Time speed seems to speed up. But for most officers, time seems to slow down. And we don't know why. Um, but what does it mean? Like, for instance, officers are saying that a person's pulling a gun from their waistband and they have their weapon at low ready, which should be fast enough to bring it up and shoot. 
And yet that person gets their gun out and fires at them before they even begin to, to pull their gun up, to, to align it, to put the gun, the bullet on target. Uh-huh. And so it was, was that delay a product of a time distortion, a perceived time distortion? Was it a product that the reaction is slower than the action? Was it a issue about the perception and kind of cognitive stuff mm-hmm. is, is more important? And how long does that take? Um, so we got into measuring the time elements okay. and very quickly started looking at the time elements and how we uh, needed to train officers so they didn't become victim to the time elements. Huh. Um, well, so, well, when we th- think about time, like even if biologically, is it just simply a memory issue of how we recall and remember the events that it it feels slower as we retell them, or because I mean time is consistent it, it we can we can mm-hmm. calculate that we can look at time itself but that human experience within that moment even if it's just for a few seconds um how we can um basically take that time and almost expand it out like you're zooming in on that timeline mm-hmm. even in three seconds is how does that correlate with just human biology and brain science you have pulled back the layer of a very complex problem. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go below that surface layer because you're absolutely okay. right. I, I mean, we tend to think of time as regulated by a clock, and uh, and by the way, we're kind of pretty good at measuring time. Uh-huh. And we are. We've got like ten different ways our brain measures time, um, none of which are connected to the emotional system, which is really kind of interesting. Yeah. And, and by the way, do you know how long it took me to say that? And if you go back and think about it, you will have created a time memory. You will not have actually measured the time it took me to say that. Absolutely. So th- that's interesting that the perception of time is impressionistic and um, actually almost like a Rorschach, very creative sort of process. But there are, I, I will start with first, there's at least 10 different ways that our brain measures time. Okay. And usually we're pretty good at it. Uh, if, for instance, uh, and I spent a great deal of time, I, I w- went to university on a, a track scholarship uh, and have multiple records in, in high school. Uh, and if you wanted a 52 second quarter on a cinder track, I could give you a 52.5 or a 51.5. I would come within a half a second of that. And that's not unusual. Almost every high school, good high school athlete can do that. Can And now they've got better tracks. <laughs> the regularity. Yeah, yeah, they do. But, but it is possible to have very precise measurements as you convey your body over a, a whole quarter mile or a half mile. I mean, that, that, it's just amazing. So what's going on when people say, uh, as um, oh, oh, if if you look at like in, in the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald, mm-hmm. um, oh, I'm, I'm blocking on the name of the singer, uh, Canadian singer that, uh, that that did the song on that. But he said, "Where's the love of God gone mm. when when the storm shifts minutes or seconds to hours?" which is really, you know, perceptual distortions or this altered time perception is part of a human experience. Uh, And it is um, because it's not connected to emotional stuff and because literally our brain may be operating faster uh, at some components than our um, more cerebral stuff is aware. Okay. Um, we may actually perceive because we're moving faster, the time is slower. It's slowed. It's is slower. that is that is that correlated to like? Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. Like contextual clues and schemas that we make is that part of the time equation? Um, that certainly is part of the of the time equation uh, because how we know how long things take is part of our, our memory, it's part of our history, and it's part of a gauge that we judge things against. Mm. Mm. So that certainly is, is part of it. But we've spent a, a great deal of time looking at that. And that issue 
about the discrepancy between the perceived time, the action of the person and what the officer was actually doing all kind of pushed us into researching how long does this stuff actually take? Mm -hmm. And can officers actually be where most of them were stepping into and confronting somebody or do we need to train them better and differently so that what they're doing is they're better prepared for any type of encounter and they're able to offset an assault. Mm. So um, for instance, I, I was just responding to somebody who is training somebody and what is it now a, um, it, it is still a very strong terrorist zone. Uh, and they were dealing with uh, uh, ambush situations mm -hmm. in, in which a alleged suicidal person uh, of an identified race and particularly a terrorist organization has a gun to their head and is threatening to, to shoot themselves. And whether or not the officers should take that as a threat and what they should do in response to it. And there's, there's no question that the time frame to go from here to shooting the officer is a quarter second or less and certainly no longer than a third of a second. Mm -hmm. And so if we are to keep the officers safe that are responding and trying to defuse this hostage situation and to keep the person safe who may actually be suicidal versus someone who is terroristic and just sucking the officers in, drawing them in to shoot them. Yes, sir. Um, how, do, how do we set it up so that the officers intervening are safe? Wow. And the person who has the potential to assault them doesn't have the opportunity, but the officer has the opportunity to intervene if that's appropriate. And, and so we move from understanding action and reaction stuff into more complex kind of structuring about the training we need to provide officers about how to read a situation, how to read it before they enter it. Because when they're in it at a point, even if they've got a gun up, they're not safe. And we know they're not safe. We've measured that. So how can we keep them from shooting inadvertently or inadvertently being fodder for the person who's attempting to kill them and eventually kill themselves? Right. And so the, our, our research started there, but has expanded out to, to look at perception, training, decision-making. And I'm, I'm sure we'll get into some of our, our latest research, which deals with emotional arousal, eye scan issues, uh, level of, of training and connection to the detection of um, relevant cues in the environment about right. how to deal with them, um, et cetera. Well, but yeah. we started there with time. And, okay. and time, time has always been a core element for our training. Before we specifically look at some of these issues, when you started this back in the 70s and started having questions, um, were the questions back then still similar to the modern day um, high stress questions or has, um, ha has it changed how you look at some of those early research problems? Um, how I'm, I'm curious as to the evolution of, are we, are we that much farther than what we were? And is it, is it moving the needle to help these officers? And empirically is what I'm looking at. If we can really show that like, because of this work, here are some of the outcomes that we're having, even though we're in the midst of an error of an incredible amount of officers losing their lives. Uh, there is no question that the, the early research we did uh, is still very significant and very relevant. Um, and we're doing more of that you know, with more sophisticated measurements. And, and we're always aware as we're doing something to, to keep that time element in mind as we're working with that. So, so it still is a core of our work that we're looking at the human performance aspects of um, action and reaction and the dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that brings us into a, a, another world and that's the very basis of decision-making hmm. because time shapes decision-making. If an assault occurs in a quarter to a half a second, mm -hmm. the officer's reaction is basically a response type that is called fast and frugal. 
and the officer has no chance to consider any options within that. If the uh, action is between a half a second, and I'm I'm giving guidelines, not, yeah, uh, not bright ab- lines. Ab- absolutely. Uh, okay, but if the if the action um, to assault the officer or as a threat evolves is somewhere in the realm of a half a second to two or three or more, more um, the officer's acting off patterns of behavior. But even within that time compressed circumstance, the officer has a decision, but that decision is very limited. Hmm. And the officer will make a decision based on both sacrificing and satisfying. They will satisfy the need to make a decision and sacrifice other options or acquiring more information that help them shape that decision. And so they have to, they have to make a decision in which they sacrifice a lot of information. That and cost that, benefit analysis happens oh, very quickly. <laughs> it, it, it's very quick. Well, well, think about, you know, it takes me uh, one second to say 1001. Mm-hmm. And so that's a time frame we're talking about. And the officer has to make a decision with whatever information they have. Uh, and they will sacrifice a lot, which is why we should look at these things uh, from the officer's state of mind and what they know versus what we find uh, retrospectively. But but the interesting thing here is the officer um, has one choice. They don't have two choices or three choices. And as they're implementing something and driving it forward, particularly under time compressed circumstance, they don't have the ability to critically analyze the effectiveness of this uh, mm. and to change or alter it. So uh, if you look at Gary Klein's work, for instance, with recognition prime decision-making, he says off, uh, officers in this situation will take the first, meaning the first choice, that's the only choice you get. You have no others. You can't simultaneously consider things because even if you say simultaneously consider things, you're out to two seconds and the event is over. Yeah, And, and so, we equate that to a lot of times you hear in, in – any first responder circle, really, primarily even thinking with law enforcement, of we talk about this factor of hesitation. And that hesitation, I'm putting this together from what you're saying, is born out of that decision-making time that we have. Right. And, and so uh, we obviously want to mitigate and reduce the amount of hesitation that happens. And is what I'm what I'm thinking is your research allows us to know where to focus our attention so that that's the mitigation of hesitation, if that makes right, sense. Right. And we're driving it in a number of directions at this point, which is including, but far from the original research on action reaction dynamics, hmm. but, but it's an important component for, for instance, to continue back to decision-making if it's three to four seconds or more, the officer can begin to move into something beyond pattern recognition and into actual uh, some sort of decision-making, rational decision-making process based on rules. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. According to Klein and according to our research and knowledge, the best decision-maker is one who knows a lot about the area they're making decisions about. And in the police world, particularly those leaving training and even leaving field training, there's a chasm between the rule and the tool. And that chasm, what exists between that chasm is what makes the expert decision maker. Think about it. The uh, Joan Vickers who worked with us on iScan did iScan research for the uh, Canadian Orthopedic Association on doctors and what doctors, what they're looking at and what they're anticipating as they're, as they're doing surgery. And the novice surgeon will look at the first cut and set up for the second cut. And the expert surgeon who has a lot of mucking around, a lot of stuff in between the rule and the tool will look at the cut and look at up to five cuts ahead. Wow. And when you think about that, whether it's surgery or whether it's the experience that people get uh, playing baseball in Little League or some Pop Warner football, 
And you think about how that evolves from a knowledge of the rules and the game experience into the fake, which buys the football player five yards Mm -hmm. because that defensive player cannot read, anticipate, and respond quick enough, even with a known player, a known opponent, and a known event guided by rules and referees. They still can't read and predict what's going to happen. Uh, but we expect an officer with this huge chasm to meet a person who provides threatening behavior uh, and, and to be a perfect reactor. And there are no rules, <laughs> usually unknown environment, uh-huh. unknown person, all sorts of hazardous environmental conditions. And the officer has to not only read, but be right on time and perfect. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely amazing And people don't realize that what they're watching on TV where errors are made, mistakes are made, and that sort of thing. And the real world where officers operate is so different. Hmm. They would not expect their pro athletes to have the same level of performance that they're giving to police officers. So our research is now in this area. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at decision-making and uh, what we need to provide officers in training and skill building, that's a large reason why Mike uh, is working with us because of his, his skill at training uh, and, and his knowledge of training. And that's why in our more advanced courses, uh, we literally bring in uh, some of the top motor learning people in the world uh, to provide us with methodology for how to, how to build the kind of skills we need for the challenges officers face on the street versus the current and structural format we're providing. How, with that question that you're answering that or looking at the the chasm, is has your research shown or provided any guidance for police academies and or um, an understanding of? hey, we really need this much time, one year, six months, five years, for an officer right. to h- equip himself through a variety of call responses to be able to know what to look at. And obviously there's a training element, but there's also, I think, um, a live exercises in terms of real life, what you're encountering um, mm-hmm. obviously informs quite a bit as well. Is there anything that you've arrived at to say that, hey, once an officer's been executing this, you know, many traffic stops or this many calls for service over the course of this period of time, we're seeing better decision making. Um, Actually, yeah. And we're very discouraged by Washington and their Band-Aid approach to whatever problems they have identified, but not research, because many of the problems they're trying to solve are not well research problems or if they are, um, they're not well understood. And how Washington is trying to solve them is just beyond us. Um, We're seeing a lot of political motivations for the solutions that are imposed, not any of of which are based on evidence or science or actual facts of what's occurring in the police world. Um, But when we look at something, and and I know Mike addressed some of the issues here, but one of our studies we made 10,000 videos on skill acquisition and perishability over three major state academies, uh, all of whom train somewhere in the realm of 600 to 800 uh, plus hours. And and by the way, a comparison of that is uh, Petco requires 800 hours before a pet groomer is allowed to trim a pet's hair without supervision. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> so either, either Petco is really overdoing it, <laughs> or you. when we train an officer for 600 hours, yeah. um, we are really doing the officer an injustice. Mm-hmm. Um, and the average is 840, and that's between the five and 600 hour academy on one end and the 1650 hour academy, which is Los Angeles. But it's not only the number of hours. It's a methodology of instruction. And a lot of the methodology, excuse me, relies on what's called block and silo. Block meaning things are taught at once, like firearms are taught all at once Mm -hmm. uh, when the uh, academy trainers are there and the range is available. 
Uh, in the state of Minnesota, for instance, uh, we have remote ranges from our training sites and therefore we'll transport people for a week to a training site and they'll get 40 hours of firearms instruction. Mm -hmm. And that's all they'll get with that skill. They made a couple of simulators. Um, the same with the uh, uh, driving, pursuit driving. Um, they'll go to a, an abandoned runway and run a course mm -hmm. for a couple of times. And, and that's it. And that's part of the the block approach and silo because it's not done with anything else. But usually when officers draw their gun, it's done in conjunction with tactical issues, with positioning, uh, with an awareness of, of threat, some sort of evaluation, some understanding of, of what is needed here, including communication, problem solving, the ability to establish contact, build rapport, influence, and if not, what the threat level is. All of that is tremendous decision-making. Mm -hmm. complex processing uh, and requires extensive clinical skill. And our disappointment is we train law enforcement as if it is a trade and we don't train it very well. Your average barber cosmetologist in most states require twice as much training as do police officers. And we won't go anywhere near what electricians and plumbers do in relation to police training. And you will say, but we have an FTO program beyond that. And our response is the latest research is telling us two thirds of officers graduating from an academy in the United States today have little or no formal FTO program after they graduate. Wow. And we have multiple states that you will be licensed as a peace officer for up to a year before you get any academy training at all. Yeah. And, and I don't know a profession that does anything like this, that has any responsibility for anybody, uh, health, safety, well-being. And the tragedy is if an officer makes a mistake, they pay the price. Nothing in the system changes. Mm. And that's because we're also the only profession that doesn't use error to provide correctional feedback to the system. Think about Potter. Mm -hmm. Nothing will change in Minnesota because Potter made an error. She's up. She's paying a price. She has paid a horrible price so far. And yeah. nothing will change. We will only defend what we've got and blame her more. Mm -hmm. And her error is a systems error. And by the way, we have 130 years of research that says that error is a systems error. It's not a personal error. It's done by a person, but it's a product of a system and is also a product of an engineering design factor. And I know this is the wrong place. Maybe no. we'll go there later. Yeah. But, but when we look at training of officers, we found, I'll come back to block and silo and then yeah. go anywhere you want. Yeah. We found that block and silo production by time the officers learned a skill mm -hmm. and the difference between that skill and graduation. At graduation, the officers could describe the skill, but the critical step was missing enough that the effectiveness in real world situation was gone. Wow. For instance, if the officer learned weapon takeaway, somewhere around 50% of officers made contact with the arm or the hand as a first step in weapon takeaway. Without that contact with the, with the arm, the hand, or the gun, anything you do after that is, is not relevant. Um, so uh, literally baton strikes, baton strikes, 28% effectiveness six months after graduation. We looked at firearms. The difference between a novice who've never had a gun in their life and accuracy at common con, uh, gunfight distances and someone who's gone through a 60 hour police training program with a very credible licensed department. The difference between the officer and the total novice is 10% accuracy at common gunfight distances. Uh, and we spend a lot of money for that 10%. And it's important. But Absolutely. But boy, we could do so much better. 
and 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 we're not and we're not and um anyway so we have come a long way from the action reaction We've looked at trying to understand Absolutely. time issues and, and time alterations and perceptual issues. Um, and right now we're deep in the heart of what makes an expert and how do we build an expert and how does all of this experience and interviewing and all of that come together to help us move the officer and the profession forward. Yeah. Th there's a lot of anecdotic, um, anecdotal uh, take on this idea of uh, every time you see a, um, a human error occur in the law enforcement profession, inevitably it feels like we always hear, well, that's because of the litigation age we live in, because of the fear of the consequence of taking that action is causing a greater delay in a proper response. Mm -hmm. And... While is there anyone that you're aware of even kind of looking at is is that a true statement or is that just our um, feeble attempt to make sense of the mistakes officers are making? I, I think there's some truth to it, uh, and I think you need to look at each individual circumstance to determine uh, whether or not that truth is is relevant. But there's no question that the information we process in the scene. Uh, is biased. We perceive it in a biased fashion. We alter it uh, because of how we see it. We, we, never, we never see things as a camera sees it. And boy, do we have high scan research <laughs> that tells us that. Uh, and there was even a, a comment made in, in the Potter case. Uh, um, I was watching TV last night. I was just astounded. One of the news channels had a guy on who said, uh, I could see on Potter's camera uh, that the gun was present for at least two to three seconds. And you're telling me she couldn't tell it was a gun? I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Well, the body cam is on the chest. The gun is here. <laughs> There's no question that Potter is trying to look at Dante Wright and what her partner is doing and solve this problem. And so the officer's brain is all involved in that, but the camera's recording the, recording the gun. So the, you know, the important question is, what is the officer seeing, and is that different than what a camera records? And there's no question that the individual perspective, even um, the difference between two officers, can be profound in a situation. Yeah. Um, the the common. Um, phrase in sports psychology with people that have done eye scan research, mm -hmm. looking at where experts look and novices look, including us and our work in the police world. We just finished a major study on eye scan and the connection between eye scan, emotional regularity, emotional arousal, and, uh, and expertise. Is, is that but, the, that's the study, if I recall from the, the class, where you had a uh, subject up at a table talking about maybe it was a voter issue and then you had a subject behind them that was uh, really profound for me to be able to see that how where that trained um, or expert person looks right. and responds versus the novice of it's just this constant very um uh very disorganized. Almost bouncy. Yeah, just yep. I, I don't know where. I know I should be looking in that direction, but I don't know what to look at. Right, right. It's it's like you looking at a totally new scene that you have no idea what, what to look at. and But you know there's going to be dire consequences if you don't figure it out really <laughs> soon. <laughs> and, and we just finished a, a major study on that, seriously, um, a month ago, um, involving 52 officers, a major incident that took minutes to unfold, um, high-speed run incident investigation, integration of, of domestic violence, the rest of it, and then it ends up as a, as a shootout. And there is no question that the expert knows or is able to predict with a high degree of certainty what, where, when, and how something's going to unfold. And the novice really doesn't see very much or know very much at all. And so information, the point is information is filtered. Even how we look for information is filtered by our training and, and experience. Um, and so that's an important part. And then 
how memory is stored is another important issue. And then how we uh, express it is something else. If you ask me, for instance, what elements of my personal life, I would filter that very extensively. <laughs> <laughs> so I was talking about it. I, I think most uh, of us can relate to, to, to that. Yeah, right. right. And, and so when we talk about what does an officer see and know and how do they express things, we know right from the beginning that uh, an officer's experience helps them see situations really differently than civilians do. Mm-hmm. And civilians will look at a body cam and they'll see something and they expect the officer to see it. But the officers focus on something different. Uh, they may see movement behind somebody and the officers looking at the person's hands. So we spend a great deal of time in academies teaching people to look at the hands. Yeah. And again, we'll be in the hand and a civilian won't see that because they don't know how critical the hands are in these types of situations. And so they won't see what the officers see or they won't understand the behavior of it. Um, most people get their uh, training from TV. We did a preliminary study. It's, it's only a pilot study. We tested 400 uh, university students at eight different universities. And they told us that cops use deadly force one out of five citizen encounters. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, the, ac- uh, the actual, <laughs> the actual <laughs> force fractions are force in, in all arrest situations, which is usually where force is used, is well under 1%. And use of deadly force in all situations is well under one thousandth of 1% of that. So it's it's really amazing. What, what was that rooted in? Did, did you Oh, well, if at... you look at uh, NCIS LA, you look mm-hmm. at NCIS, you look at LA SWAT, uh, you look at FBI. I mean, literally about every five calls uh, uh, F5, whatever, uh, r- things that they're responding to, there's a shoot-up. So it, it is great learning on the part of the university students who are watching TV, but it's totally inaccurate. Yeah. And, and the, the, real, um, the real disappointing thing is they don't know how unreal that is. Mm. And so when they protest for rights of this group or that group, or that there's allegations of this or that, they have no clue. And, and that's kind of, that's the Washington dilemma I, I'm dealing with is, uh, and so disappointed at is yeah. the research is there uh, and the politicians are unfortunately not understanding the reality versus the social fantasy that is being projected by a variety of people. Yeah. Well, and that right there is why I think what you all are doing is so important because I find my myself in this, um, you know, almost thought loop of when something tragic happens to an officer or to a, a suspect in, mm-hmm. in many of these cases, um, we often hear the law enforcement community get very frustrated because it's like, you don't understand, you've never been in our shoes, yet it's mm-hmm. plastered on every media, social media outlet that's out Mm -hmm. there. And Mm -hmm. so how do we teach our own to be better equipped to inform? Because a lot of times we retract from, it's like they just wouldn't understand, it's not worth my time. But I think there's that, it's it's a balancing act of there is an educational piece to what we do. And it first Mm -hmm. has to start with us understanding why we do what we do. And I think without what you guys are doing, it is, it's difficult to do that, to find the words for what I'm experiencing and feeling and seeing and remembering um, mm-hmm. in that moment. Right. The, um, I ask you to consider this. Officers deal with human beings uh, and almost all of their work, at least for the line officer. Uh, and administrative staff is dealing with human beings. We have officers involved in a variety of technological fields that have very little contact with people. um, But for the most part, it's human interaction. And in today's world, we're getting a lot of people that do not have a lot of world experience coming into the academy. And so they are deficient in what we call social and emotional skills. Um, And so if you look at that as a problem, And then you look at another area, and this will get to where you're speaking about. 
Um, I ask you to consider that law enforcement is not a trade. Law enforcement is a profession and it's much more than just a profession. It is a clinical profession hmm. and clinical because it is based a lot on assessment. Whenever an officer gets a call and begins to respond, they're beginning to make an assessment process. As they get at the scene, there's more information coming in and it modifies their assessment process, but that assessment is ongoing and continually working. And then they do some sort of decision-making and that decision-making is diagnosis. It's an analysis of what they, they gathered, the information they gathered, and how they're seeing it in relation to a possible solution. And a possible solution could be anything from persuading someone in the domestic to uh, comply with your recommendation so that you actually prevent them from more harm, uh, to cooperating with a runaway who you know might be a, a survivor of sexual violence uh, in their family residence, and that's why they're fleeing. And how do you persuade them? To, that's a decision process, too. It's a diagnosis Absolutely. decision process. And then we look at force, and there's lots of stuff about diagnosis and what type of force, and level of force. Mm -hmm. do, can you make contact? Can you uh, establish some form of influence? Can you persuade? If so, what type? All of that's decision process. It comes out of information gathering, decision making, and then you, you implement the solution, whether it be a particular type of persuasion or an action or whatever, all of that takes time. And what is interesting is when we, uh, and I was just watching an advertisement for a, an academy and it was all about force and violence and intimidation. And I'm thinking, you look at how much force is used. Mm -hmm. Literally, we just finished it. <laughs> and by the way, when you need it, you better be really damn good. Yeah. Because we, we presented data, uh, I guess from, we presented data from Norway, four-year police academy. Four years, not Jeez. four years of a university wow. degree with some 600 hours of police training on top. Four years Actual police academy. academy. The average person in the study could bench press 180 pounds 10 times, run a mile and a half in a little over 10 minutes. <laughs> These guys That's were phenomenal. fantastic. Yeah. They did a study on injury in arrest and control, and they found a difference in fitness led directly to more injury on the person and the officer. And they're dealing at a level of fitness that is it's in the stratosphere compared to what we have in our academies. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're finding relationships between those things. And, and so the, the, the issue is how do we train? How do we build that skill? How do we work with that in a way that really facilitates great performance? Because when you need whatever level of force there is, you better be good at it. But what do cops spend most of their time doing, persuading people in and out of some sort of problem situation, getting them to Absolutely. work with them? And I can count on one hand the number of academies I know that have any core at all on persuasion. And it is the most common police skill. So when we look at decision making, we need lots of decision-making. And when we look at the skill about what officers really need, we need a lot of communication and persuasion. Um, and is, is, that, not is that at the, the core of the de-escalation course that you, you all are now offering? Is that kind of the crux of where that came from? That, that's, that's part of it. Um, a, a core component on the on the de-escalation course deals with um, the person's ability to contain and control, to establish contact, build rapport, have some influence. Because if you don't have that, then you need de-escalation that moves along a more tactical line. And what is unique for us is we're... And it's because of the person who created that program and myself, I originally started work as a um, intake social worker in a psychiatric facility before there were antipsychotics and tranquilizers. Mm. <laughs> 
So you know how difficult that is. And I have yes, I've assessed the use of force uh, in a variety of, of state uh, institutions, and particularly here in Minnesota, and created a communication program that to this day is still taught in our state psychiatric facilities. And I created that for them in the 1980s. So um, what, one of the things we observed way back then, and one of the things we're dealing with in the, in the street is that officers don't have what they have in psychiatric facilities. Um, and they don't have access to the drugs, to the kind of staff, to the containment process. And to expect an officer to um, negotiate with someone who they can't establish contact with, can't build rapport, can't have influence with, either because of psychosis, because of some sort of uh, emotional disorder, because of chemical distress, or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you can't get through that fog, whatever confusion is going on in the person's disorganized mind, you have no capability of influence. So the very first thing we teach in de-escalation is how do you look at thought, emotion, and behavior to assess what type of influence you might have? And if so, what's the most effective way to do that? Um, and then we get into some of the other stuff that's, uh, that's critical on reading and assessing, uh, including how to emotionally regulate yourself uh, to be effective. But using, using uh, questions to... Um, you know, with, with active listening, for instance, just by way of an illustration, our eyes might be different. We do teach active listening in which you use paraphrasing and, and redirection and, and that sort of thing. Yes, but you're a great interviewer. And I know you're listening because you ask appropriate and relevant questions. And that tells me you care. You care about the subject topic and you care about what I'm saying about it. Mm -hmm. And so if we ask four questions, descriptive, what's happening wrong? When did it start? What do you think brought this about? And have you ever had it before? And if so, what did you do that made a difference? And if we keep repeating those questions, descriptive, describe what's happening. Tell me some more. I'd like to more about that. What about this? All descriptive questions. And we dig into that stuff. And we begin to peel into things just by asking questions. We show people we care. We show them we're interested. We show that we're willing to help, that the problem is, is solvable. I mean, the message we create by just asking questions is really powerful. And that's a component part of our course. A lot of cops find active listening to be kind of phony. And actually, if they go home and practice it on their spouse, their spouse will tell them, this is phony, cut that out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a, 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 a high level of intentionality in what you're doing when you're engaging in active listening, and that intentionality a lot of times does feel forced. But yep. in reality, that's what, in my experience, has created a level of ownership in the person I'm talking to. Yep. Right. Is because they're answering a question. It's not me identifying the problem. They're right. a actually having, we're, we're creating self-awareness in the person we're speaking to. Right, right. But if you ask just questions, you can totally almost ignore paraphrasing. Uh, you have to be careful about your paraverbals because <laughs> you, can, you can go, have you ever had this happen before? <laughs> <laughs> what is that a problem <laughs> yeah right? or, no or, you're, you're or absolutely you right say, or, or you could be really sincere and genuine and, and say yeah but what's your experience been like this have you ever had it happen before and, and what you're looking for is what did they do and how did it work because it worked then why is that working now and could you use it now so yeah. that whole that whole set about four common questions and how you work with them is for us really, really important. But that's kind of, we, we, we uh, use a lot of the standard stuff, but we have some stuff that makes us really unique and it comes out of a uh, really good foundation uh, about working with people in the midst of a crisis. Yeah. And it comes out of, I supervised a suicide line for over a quarter century. Uh, and ran a suicide line um, myself. I, I, was, I was on a suicide line. Um, and I've got 140 some hours of hostage negotiation experience. Huh. So, uh, you know, it's, I've got a lot of experience. And so does Dr. John Azar, who helped create this program, John Azar Dickens, and uh, Nicole Florisi, who teaches it. And, and uh, they, anyway, 
Joe D'Amico, yeah. uh, our, our instructional staff have really a good foundation uh, in, in what works. Yeah. So here, here we go. How does everything that we've talked about um, slam up against this outcry for recruitment and retention and where agencies are feeling the pressure to pump out officers through these quick academies and we we can look at research and show that hey the product that is coming out of these even for well-intentioned recruits we're not necessarily creating the best officer out there or mm-hmm. we're the not yet uh or maybe looking at it as what is the target when someone graduates? What is uh, a level of competence in the field Mm -hmm. that an officer, we can actually put our stamp and say, now you're ready to be in the field. Because that desire for the best trained officers, I think is there both in the community and in the civilian world, yet we have this massive shortage of policing going on in our communities nationwide. Mm -hmm. We have a number of journal articles out and a number of news lines uh, on our research in academies and the efforts uh, to make it better. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's there's no question um, that there's a lot we can do to improve. But in those news lines, Uh, we came back to one thing. We always closed with, it's a darn good thing. So far, we've been able to hire good people Hmm. Um, because there is no profession that gives their employees so little and expects so much. Hmm. And we think that kind of summarizes. And if we don't hire good people who rise above the limitations of the training, who bring their own personal life experience and and initiative at personal development. Uh, if we if we don't do that, uh, we're going to be in even more trouble than we are because putting butts in a squad car is not the answer. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely a complex problem that I I love not only thinking about but help drive conversation in a way that we can uh, come up with better solutions. Uh, if, if you would, if we could transition a minute, I, I know we're going to be coming up on a uh, certain time here in a little bit, but I'd love to, I, I don't know how you're doing on time. Um, if I, we can go a little bit longer. Sure. Yep. Um, I'm thinking to go to return to this. Um, and even if we want to use the Potter trial as an example, um, of diving in a little bit, because I think this is important in the civilian world to understand generally human error and what are what is some mitigation or some um, important uh, things to think about and consider when we have human error. And then if if we could if you could transition, you had mentioned that there's this uh, more than likely situation we'll be in where nothing changes out of uh, even a, a trial that's going on right now. What would be those steps um, with understanding that humans are out there doing this job and there are errors that happen? What mm-hmm. would be an appropriate recommendation for things that we should look at to improve uh, what's happening? Well, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, we, um, we have an advanced specialist course <laughs> in which we, we spend a fair amount of time looking at, at error. And we look at James Reason's book on uh, error. And uh, we kind of touch on some of the 130 years of research uh, that relates to human error. Uh, in fact, the father of American psychology, William James in 1890, in the first book on psychology, um, written in the United States, um, spoke about error and he spoke about error. He said, you know, we do things automatically and I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do things automatically that bring about good results and we do things automatically that bring about bad results. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And and we have to look at that because literally 
um, medicine, aeronautics industry, uh, the NASA, uh, the um, engineering world. Uh, I, you can't name a profession that hasn't studied error and the foundation of errors. And, and there's two camps with errors. Um, by the way, uh, the research on this is voluminous. Um, and recently in relation to the Potter trial, we had a professor out of University of Western Illinois who said uh, she couldn't find any research on slip and capture errors, which is absolutely uh, astounding. I, I, I can't believe it. Said it was not well researched. And just for um, the clarification for those listening, the slip and capture is what the error that grabbing a taser versus a gun or a gun versus a taser fits into, correct? Right, right. And, and it is um, it is actually that what that's what William James was referring to uh, in 1890. When you do things automatically and you make a mistake, uh, it's because what is, and, and the interesting thing is James refers to practice because he said practice doesn't mitigate errors. Uh, in fact, often the more practice you have, here, here, here's the issue. Fundamentally, when we, we learn a skill like drawing a gun or drawing a taser, we pay a lot of attention to it. And the more skillful we get, the less attention we pay to it. And the more we rely on automatic performance. Mm -hmm. And as we get better at automatic performance, much of our brain is freed up to deal with the problem. So if you look at what Potter was addressing, time compressed circumstance, Multiple factors, urgency, meaning if she doesn't do things, her partner could be seriously injured or this guy could get away, got a warrant for his arrest, had to do it. There's a whole variety of things going on, excuse me, in Potter's head at this point in time. So what is she directed toward and what is she relying upon? And she's relying on an automatic program that the motor component the action that is occurring turns out to be erroneous. Mm. Uh, okay. Now, Airbus has a whole factory set up to avoid the type of error that Potter had. Huh. And that Airbus has designed all of their cockpits in their airplanes to avoid Potter's error. I mean, if there isn't an end of volume, why would they spend the billions of dollars to do that if there wasn't voluminous research on slip and capture and other errors that they were designing their factories and their product to avoid? Just think about the, the relationship of that and the billions of dollars they spent to avoid that. Mm -hmm. if, if we look at the medical world in the United States, there's anywhere from 160 to 200 thousand deaths per year by medical error. Approximately a third of that is the type of error that Potter had. And Force wow. Science has been at two international medical conferences by, by invitation in the United Kingdom to speak about our work on decision training in the police world and the avoidance of errors in that and how our work would contribute to what they learned and recommended in the medical world nationwide. The World Health Organization has a chapter in a book for every physician on errors. And a portion of that is how to avoid slip and capture errors. Now, within that avoidance are two factors. One is the cognitive processing that leads to the error. Uh -huh. And the other is the engineering problem. And before we go into that, I need to introduce one more concept. Okay. That is in time compressed circumstances. When someone is driving forward a motor action and they expect an outcome, mm -hmm. our brain shuts down the sensory process that is involved in that because it would interfere with what else is going on, including the intended consequences of the act. I give an example not connected to law enforcement. If you're swinging a bat or a golf club and you commit to the intense action of that strike. Mm -hmm. Tell me what the bat felt like in the middle of that swing. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's what happens to our brain. This is part of a researched and well-known phenomenon in athletics that when you're ex you're implementing a motor outcome, a motor action, 
and you're driving it forward within time compressed and urgent circumstance. Your brain is addressing things and pushing off other elements that would interfere with the effective outcome, the directed intended outcome, as you're relying on automatic motor movements and action to make that happen. That's why you can take a taser and a gun and say, wow, look, a different color, different weight. If we t only textured the, the taser differently, doesn't matter. It's an L-shaped instrument. It looks like a gun. It feels like a gun. It is operated like a gun, unless you do something dramatically different with that instrument. We used to think it was the non-dominant hand draw. Mm -hmm. There would be enough discrepancy there. But Potter destroyed that explanation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, and by the way, she has never used her taser. And she has never fired her gun in her whole history as a police officer. Only in training. And taser training, nowhere near. Taser training is taught in a block and silo. Mm -hmm. You seldom get to use the taser, actually, because the, uh, whatever, the which problems. put on the end of the yeah. cartridges yep. are, are so expensive. Yeah, so practice with a taser is minimum. It's in a silo. And it's done in a block. Mm. And what do we know about that skill? Any skill is done in a block and silo erodes quickly. Literally within weeks, it's gone. And so you look at the uh, practice and the stress and the motor programs and the rest of it. There's a heck of a lot of research that says what Potter did was an error that is a product of poor police training. Uh, starting with what her rookie did trying to arrest somebody in the via the car door with the engine still running mm -hmm. <laughs> poor control of cuffs <laughs> da, 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 da. It so it's yeah. all about poor police training uh and it's it's all about engineering uh, but unfortunately potter's paying the price absolutely and, and that's how it goes and nothing will change in training in minnesota despite what we know about why that error occurred Universities have their fiefdom. Police have their fiefdom. Criminal justice thinks they know how to teach things. If you teach something like criminal law tested by multiple choice test, people should be able to know all the rules and use all the rules exactly how they should be. And if we only teach a class better in criminal law, we'd solve the problem. If we only teach a class in ethnicity, we'd solve the problem. We go, wow. We need, we need to revamp the whole thing. Um, actually, our suggestion is if we looked at nursing, we'd do a hell of a lot better. If we modeled police training on nursing and started integrating the clinical with the academic uh, in the first year and began to push it out so by the time people are in their um, junior year, they're actually doing ride-alongs and integrating uh, professional skill with academic uh, learning and integrating that with a supervisor from the university as well as a police officer part-time license them. And we would eliminate a lot of problems in the police world if we'd work at a integrated interdisciplinary clinical program. I'll give, I, I'll give you an example. Let me yeah. Just, yeah. In the academies that we test, three major state academies, one third of officers left law enforcement within one year of graduation from the academy. Major loss, $100,000 to take an officer from civilian to sitting in a squad car and one third are gone. Why? I didn't know I'd have to work shift work. I didn't know I'd have to work with people who didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's th those are legitimate reasons people will put forward. Now that's self-reporting you know it, it, mm -hmm. is it is it deeper than that i don't know I, 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 in I, I some cases it probably is but uh not in all and but I, I think in about a third people don't know what they're getting into mm -hmm. that we don't set it up that they are coming on board with what they saw on tv yeah. or what their imagination is and uh i don't know about your uh your department but uh, i think it'd be really good if people rode for a couple of shifts 
for a couple of different weeks with a couple of different officers to really see what they're getting into at the very least. But I think we should have a, a, a better clinically based program. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate you tackling that. And I mean, we'll, you know, uh, re it remains to be seen what, what comes out of uh, this most recent one with Potter. And I do hope um, that the conversation continues, but I do fear, like you have said, that um, it's just going to just continue being what it is. And that's terrifying in and of itself that we're not driving forward with um, better questions. Well, the last thing I'd like to talk about before we close, sir, would be uh, this idea, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry to boil it down to uh, this, but when we watch video as police officers, when the civilians see um, a police video on television, would you talk a little bit about maybe some of the questions we should be asking before a complete conclusion is drawn, even off of a 30-second, one-minute video. Um, this was a uh, pretty uh, amazing conversation I remember you having in the final days of the course I sat through. And there's just, I, I think, some helpful considerations that we should think about when we're, you know, in a <laughs> non-academic sense, evaluating what just occurred before our eyes. Well, I'd, I'd like to um, unabashedly get into some of our, our classes as well, but but we we do yes. have uh, two classes directly addressing this issue. Plus, we we covered in a number of our other courses, but we have two classes that are basically uh, different levels of, of body cam courses. One is how a department should set it up and uh, and what they need to do and what they need to understand about what they're getting and about how to store it and how to train officers, literally even where to put it. Um, and the idea being that at one point we had uh, um, a head cam, um, <laughs> but it got quickly ripped off in any type of conflict situation. Um, and so we changed the body cams, but if you put it on the right shoulder, it's anytime something goes out this way, it blocks what, so uh, very often the, the sound is is really pretty good, but we have we have a first course on how, how to work with that, what departments need to do. And then the second two-day course is all about what you get on the camera and how it interfaces with how human beings have seen, um, what the problems are with the camera, uh, all sorts of issues. For instance, uh, the Axon camera and GoPro. Mm -hmm. uh, and many cameras like that will, will state that they're dark enhanced, meaning that they see better than the human eye sees under low light conditions. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> that means <laughs> the officer's not seeing what you're seeing on the camera under low light conditions. That's really kind of an important concept mm -hmm. uh, because we don't see too well at night, uh, particularly um, uh, objects uh, and, and lines, which we use to understand what it is we're looking at, but those are obscured under low light conditions, but the camera doesn't show it. The lens on the camera is uh, projects distance outward. And so things appear further away. So someone may look like they're 20 feet away holding knife when they're actually 10 feet away holding the knife. And the officer's perception of threat is very different based on proximity. You get the angle of the camera. Uh, it could be, you know, if this is 90 degrees, you take it, most cameras are 90 to 130. The officer's peripheral vision is much greater than that. And the officer will be seeing things and looking down at things uh, that, for instance, that won't be on their camera. Uh, there's frame rates with the camera. We actually, um, now in our, our course, we have a, a uh, an illustration of a shooting that is captured on a um, a cell phone, which is filmed at about 29.97 frames per second with a telescopic lens on a cell phone. Uh, yet the squad car cam, uh, eight frames a second, does not show the threatening action the subject made toward the officer when the officer decided to make the shot. Uh, which brings us to another point, and that point is that... Um, Cameras will often capture the moment when the shot occurs, but right. they won't look at what the officer did that make that shot take place. Huh. For instance, 
the time frame it takes for a football player to throw a football from one place to another is an important time in the, when the receiver receives the ball. Well, likewise, in the police world, if an officer shoots or even engages in somebody with somebody, the time frame for them to think, to react, to engage, and then to complete the shot is not when the shot hits the body. But they will often pull it up and say, this person is not a threat at this point. Well, you've got to back up a quarter second, a half a second, or whatever it is. For instance, if you're driving toward a, uh, a semaphore and a light uh, changes from green to amber, um, you decide to put on the brake. How long does it take you to perceive, to begin to engage, and the time your car comes to a stop? The stopping of the vehicle is not when you saw the light. Well, the same way with how an officer reacts to things. But you catch something on a camera and people say, wow, um, that, that's not right. But you need to look at what the officer was seeing and, and making judgments on ahead of time. Um, the, the other issue is uh, the angle of the camera. Um, very often you'll be seeing CCTV or cell phone footage, which does not capture at all what the officer is seeing, the angle. So, God, there's just a whole, I could go on. Yeah, it's yeah. But, literally, but. literally two full days. <laughs> the, the issues about what's going on with the camera and how you interface with human behavior. Yeah, and and that really at the core is, is the idea that I think needs to be presented more is, um, and I believe uh, you or, or someone on your staff said it much like this, is the camera only shows what's happening, not what the officer is seeing. And um, that that in and of itself is a very profound statement. And right. while those things may be occurring, um, the response to those actions that the officer is taking could be uh, very different based on a whole different set of parameters that that officer is right. uh, responding under. So, no, that... Like, that that's... We were just analyzing a, sh a shooting in which cadence of gunfire was a critical issue. And what we did was uh, take the sound off the sound package with the camera because the camera films at almost 30 frames a second. Uh, and we often cannot use uh, standard filming and film rates because the camera has a processor inside it that is designed to save storage space. And if you get something as uh, quick as a muzzle flash, the camera will reject it as an error and uh, subsequently it never gets recorded. Cameras have a little brain, a processor within themselves that decide what they're gonna record. <laughs> uh, and, and so what we did was we took the sound off the sound package when the gunfire occurred because that is continuous sampling. Mm -hmm. Literally, it is, you could sample sound at 1 14,000 times per second. So uh, we took the sound of the sound package of gunfire and then we looked at cadence and looked at cadence time and what the officer was looking at uh, in, in between shots mm -hmm. and addressing issues. So what you're seeing is not what the officer is seeing, as, as you point out. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, would you talk a little bit about the force science and what you all offer? And maybe if that... that uh, age-old elevator speech of why for science? Why, who should be involved with for science? Um, okay. What are some courses? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, the mission of for science is to bring the science of human performance to the police world. And we're particularly looking at the officer and the officer, particularly in a time of crisis, using a tool. That tool could be communication. Uh, it could be physical control. It could be um, a, a weapons issue, uh, but it's a human being with that. We have a variety of staff teaching for us. Uh, in fact, the our teaching staff, MDs, PhDs, um, attorneys, uh, professional police staff, we're looking at somewhere in the realm of over a thousand peer-reviewed scientific journals by the people who have taught for us are teaching for us. And that's totally apart from literally the dozen different universities that we have done our research with. Mm -hmm. So we're really kind of pushing toward a scientific basis for, for what it is that we do. We do research, 
we do teaching and we do consultation. Um, we do have a number of courses that might be of interest to a different type of population, depending upon what their interests are. Um, but like, for instance, even our de-escalation course is for law enforcement, it's for corrections, and it's for security. And we've got a different program uh, for each because we're looking at the application. Mm -hmm. You see, it's not just the, the tool, it's how the tool is, is applied. So we've got two levels of body cam. We've got an introductory class in, into human performance that is either a one day or a two day. Uh, we have a one or a two day realistic de-escalation. We have the course that uh, you have, and I see the book on, on the table there. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, our certification book, our five day uh, certification course, uh, which involves four PhDs, two MDs, an attorney, and, uh, and two professional police people, one of whom won uh, Ailita's Trainer of the Year. So we've got uh, you know, a very skilled training staff in a very time compressed uh, circumstance, but we've got that course. We also have um, our advanced specialist course, which, in which people look at the, the research, they examine the research, they discuss it with their peers, uh, and then um, they get to listen to an expert ask questions of the expert and listen to the expert. So for instance, I mentioned uh, James Reason and errors we don't have reason, but we have a PhD who's focused on decision-making coming in and teaching uh, our decision-making and, er and errors course, uh, our, our errors course. If we look at decision-making, we look at Gary Klein mm -hmm. and Gary Klein comes in. He's uh, literally uh, written articles with a person that won a Nobel prize on decision-making. And wow. Gary and this guy are working together all the time, but Gary's at, at that level, Gary, Dr. Gary Klein's at that level. And so people read Klein's work, they'll read uh, work on, on fast and frugal decision-making, rational decision-making, and then they'll get to talk to literally the guy that created the most common type of police training uh, and police decision-making uh, in the world. So we've got that and uh, that's our advanced specialist course. And it's just, we have a fantastic teaching staff. Our stuff is based on the latest uh, research, both ours and others. And we think we're kind of cutting edge with what we're doing. Um, we, we think that there's a, a variety of people that might find value in our course. Mm -hmm. uh, attorneys, um, really, we're, we're looking at our consultations. We're finding we have tremendous benefit to helping attorneys see the human performance elements of an incident. And many of the stuff that uh, I know, uh, if you've been working with the IA at all, or any sort of um, administrative investigation with officers, you'll know that a lot of what, what's going on with that is understanding the human performance elements. If you're going to come to a fair, neutral, and fact-finding um, conclusion about what, what happened, you've got to include the human being behind the tool. It, it is part of any uh, investigation, except in law enforcement. <laughs> um, really kind of pretty amazing. NTSB, uh, FAA, um, AMA, they'll all look at human <laughs> performance factors. Right. But in law enforcement, we look at, did the person violate law or policy? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> Here's your punishment. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so anyway, so we're looking at, attorneys find it really helpful. In fact, uh, we know with the federal government, whole departments have gone back and totally rewritten their policy. Once one of their attorneys has come to our course, they said, you need to go. Other attorneys have gone, totally rewritten their post-incident policy. Yeah. So we find that investigators really need it. Adjudicators within the department is really helpful. Yeah. Very helpful for uh, investigators because a component part of investigation and what we think is, is most critical is that they understand the human performance elements, but they also take that and bring it to the trainer who really needs to understand human performance and what they're preparing people for and how to best do that. Because if we are literally wasting our time and money building a skill that erodes by time people graduate, we need to do it better. Yeah. And, and understanding the science of human learning and, and the literally the evidence about what is necessary at what level on the street and how can we have creative decision makers that can mix skills and interplay those skills. 
you know, you do an arm bar technique, for instance, on a takedown. I don't know if you're teaching it in your academy or not. Many people aren't, aren't going there. It's an old technique. But you do an arm bar technique. When you get the person to the ground, what does it turn into if it doesn't turn into cuffing? And how do you counter that? And how do you mix those techniques versus teaching arm bar separate um, in, in a silo? Even within mm-hmm. physical restraint and control techniques, it's taught in a silo. It's never done in a silo. It's integrated and it may evolve into force, into deadly force. It may come out with just communication. It is so interrelated. Um, and so trainers really need to, to come in. We're actually building a, a training course, uh, the science of, of training. We call it an MOI course at this point. Wow. It's, okay. it's a five-day course and it's all about the science of human learning and how it can be applied in academies, even within the time constraint rules that academies are currently working under, time and dollar constraints. You know, if an officer makes a mistake, the department loses a ton of money, primarily through the community, but then the community cuts training. The first thing to go with a cut in training is whatever's happening. <laughs> so, the, you know, defund the policing. Yeah. We know what's happening. Defund the policing. Training's going to go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they defund policing and, and then they don't get training or they lose literally at this point in time, New York, for instance, uh, in 2019 lost $175 million in police civil suits. Wow. I, I bet you not a million dollars was increased in the training dollars for New York City. Not a single thing changed in training. I'll, I'll put a bet on that. But they lost 175 million uh, and nothing yeah. changed. And, and it is that way. It kind of wipes away the argument of, well, how can it be worth mm-hmm. it? It's like that you want to put dollars and cents on it. Uh, the, you got. You have to look at that. It's staring you in the face, and um, and, and those people suing it, suing departments have no. They, they claim they do, but uh, I literally offered. I, I ran a hundred and eighty hour communication course uh, in the university I was teaching in. Ninety hours in basic communication, and ninety hours in uh, uh, a combination with arrest and control techniques. Mm-hmm. Literally, officers were negotiating over the barrel of a firearm with an armed subject and controlling the establishment of inner and outer perimeters, um, establishing contact, building rapport, looking for most effective ways of persuasion and directing the person, suicidal person, one of six possible outcomes. Okay, well, uh, I was asked to be part of a, uh, a civil suit on a suicide by cop uh, incident here in the state of Minnesota. And it was a huge law firm nationally. And I said, I'll, I'll do it for you and I'll do it for you for free. And I'll guarantee you a win. I want one thing. I want, after you win, I want you to put a recommendation in that police training in the state of Minnesota increase more elements involving communication and problem solving. That's all you gotta do. Won't cost you anything, I'll guarantee you win. Whatever it is you're asking for. They said they're not interested in that. Wow. Dollars. It's a much greater problem that, than what rises to the surface. <laughs> it, it always it always is. It's it, amazing, it is. the avariciousness. Yeah. Well, sir, I, I can't thank you enough. This is, uh, we've scratched the surface. Uh, Time and, is and barely. <laughs> and barely, but uh, I, I wanted to touch on a few of these to hopefully open... Um, up just this conversation to all the listeners out there and there's a conversation that is happening and we want to do things better uh, within the law enforcement community and I, I believe that everything that you all are teaching while it's very beneficial within uh, law enforcement the judicial system I think it translates very well across many professions and this research is a foundation that I believe, um, whether you're in psychology, whether you're in uh, the medical field, whether you're an engineer, um, these are considerations that we need to take. And I, I've said it to so many people since I came back from just the five-day course of, I wish I had this sooner. Now, there is that uh, 
conversation of was I prepared to understand it at the level um, that I did based on having a decade of experience um, in the a, profession. Right. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's heavy stuff. Like they, I think Mike said right at the beginning, we're going to be drinking from a fire hose and, uh, and we were, but with that said, I am, uh, just blown away by uh, what you all are doing. I uh, can't thank you enough for taking this time. We'll make sure we direct everyone. I want to make sure everyone gets to your website at some point, because it's not just, um, uh, links and information that flashes up there. It's, it's, a, a very tangible, interactive uh, site with articles and uh, the mm -hmm. research that's available right through. It's just a central uh, location that everyone can get what they need to better understand uh, the research that does exist. So, sir, is there anything um, that you'd like to, to leave us with, uh, maybe out there to yep. uh, the first responders that are, that are listening today? I, I do. We started this uh, section off with that hostage situation. And I'm here because of the admiration I had toward the dedication and professionalism of the officers involved in that incident back in 1976. And in the academy training that we did that gave us such poor results, what we found amazing was that not a single instructor didn't wish they had more time, had more ways to do it better. The professionalism within this group it's just amazing to me, the people that have stepped forward and responded to the challenge. And I don't know where we would be without that level of professionalism and commitment. And so I need to thank them. Uh, I need to thank you uh, because without that cooperation, our words would mean nothing. And, and we, we wanna work in harmony so that all of us can move the profession forward. And we're hoping that this has helped those uh, who need inside or research, uh, we're there for you. Um, and we wanna work alongside you to make us better, all of us. Absolutely. Well, sir, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, make sure uh, for everyone listening, check out, you guys are on Instagram, I believe, uh, as well as some uh, Facebook. I think also I saw a, a page there that we'll make sure we link up. Is there anywhere where else LinkedIn. that we can link LinkedIn. in? Yeah. Um, and so there's... Uh, and our, there's... our website has a lot of, our Four Science News, we've got hundreds of, of news articles, word searchable, uh, yeah. plus all of our research is up there. Awesome. Well, okay. we'll, we'll make Thank sure you. we link it up to get everybody. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. You're welcome. Thank you for your, your job as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.